I want to do today is spend a little bit of time um, talking about artificial intelligence, uh, but more importantly, how CDW is actually leveraging it to drive business outcomes. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I do have a PhD in computer science. Um, I did focus my dissertation on information retrieval, machine learning, and a little bit of AI. Um, and I wanted to just zoom out a little bit to give you a little bit of a survey of artificial intelligence and where it's been and, and where we are today and, and really where it's going to go and how we can leverage this within companies. Um, so, you know, when I think about AI, I, I think about these, these three different ages and just, you know, maybe to tip my hat, um, I grew up and started studying computer science in the end of the dark ages, so the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and, and I don't mean dark ages to be pejorative. Like, without the dark ages, if you studied your, your kind of uh, European history, there would be no renaissance, right? There's a lot of, of innovation that happened. But essentially, when you think about artificial intelligence, you know, when it started in the 1950s, um, all the way up to today, uh, the early part, the dark ages of, of, of AI had essentially two pieces of scarcity, right? One was compute power, right? You didn't have computers that were particularly fast. Um, and then you had um, essentially a, a scarcity of, of digitized knowledge. Right, so this is before the internet. Um, and the way that a lot of people approached, including me and a lot of my research, uh, was something called heavy knowledge engineering, right? And so you would essentially take a domain, a lot of this was funded by the military, and you would write these really explicit rules out, right, of how the world worked, right? Like in kind of first order predicate logic. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of effort going into understanding cognitive science. So like how do people think and how do they reason and how do they store memory? Um, and then essentially computer scientists would try, like literally with text files, trying to recreate this into systems that didn't have a lot of compute but could essentially reason, right? And there's a lot of innovation that happened. You got a lot of expert systems that came out of this. But what happened really over the last 15 years were, were two major innovations, which has really sparked the AI re revolution that we see today. Um, number one is compute got really fast and got really cheap. Right? And for those of you who've been following NVIDIA, one of the big pioneers in GPUs, which are high performance, essentially processors that can do math really fast. Um, you know, it's funny to think that chasing frames per second in first person shooters like really kind of generated this real glut of real high performance computing that could do um, essentially lots of math and floating point matrix multiplication really quickly. Number two was, was, was mass digitization of knowledge, right? So instead of having to have somebody there, you know, understand a domain and code it, you essentially had um, millions, billions of documents that were digitized for the internet or through some of the book projects scanning all this. So you had all this information readily available um, and then you had fast compute, right? And this ended up taking some of the theory that was actually written in the 50s, 60s, 70s around neural nets, if you guys have heard this, um, and made something that was theoretical on paper, actually practical. I actually remember back in the 90s uh, reading a paper about neural nets and deep learning, and they said, essentially said, hey, look, if computers were 100 times faster than they are today, computers are 100 times, 1,000 times, a million times faster than they were in the 90s now, right? So actually that became a reality. So essentially we ended up seeing this evolution, and now over the last, you know, let's say year, year and a half, um, everybody's just been talking about generative AI, generative AI, generative AI. Um, what is really important to remember is that AI has a long history. There's been evolutions along the way. Um, and not everything now is a nail where the generative AI hammer is the right tool, right? And so when you think about AI, it's an incredibly broad field. Uh, most of what we talk about recently has been machine learning, specifically neural nets and specifically generative AI. But if you kind of zoom back, AI is actually a very, very broad field. It includes machine learning as one of the branches, robotics, computer vision, expert systems, advanced analytics, natural language processing. Um, and there's all these use cases across many, many industries that you can power. Everything from how do you build self-driving cars, which I got to work on for, for several years earlier in my career. Um, how do you automate factories? How do you understand knowledge? How do you do medical diagnostics? How do you help in education? There's all sorts of practical uses that use some variety and oftentimes multiple types of artificial intelligence. It might use a little bit of natural language processing with a little bit of machine learning, maybe a little bit of generative AI, and you put this all together, and you get these really cool novel systems that can actually reason, think, and help you drive business outcomes. Now, if you think about the spectrum of AI, um, you know, take all those types of AI classes, whether it's robotics, natural language processing, expert systems, in most enterprises, right, and I'm just gonna generalize, most typical companies out there, and what I'm gonna exclude here are, are the actual technology companies. So I'm not talking about a Meta or a Tesla. I'm talking about the 98% of other businesses out there who are trying to drive an outcome for their business. And typically what you see 
um, historically have been three types of artificial intelligence that have been used within that enterprise. You have advanced analytics and algorithms, right? So if you just kind of kind of zoom back and think about what that means, the tools that people are using in this world are Excel, R, SPSS, Power BI, right? These are kind of the analytics where you have lots of data, you're kind of crunching it together, you're putting it into some sort of visual representation, um, and you're essentially um, doing work on it, right? Now, in terms of the data, you typically put structured data, right? We're talking about things that are sitting in a relational database, sitting in spreadsheets, fairly well structured, you know what it is, something that you could probably put on a hard drive and kind of pass around or dump into a text file. Um, the talent you need for this type of work, you need really smart people who understand how to use these tools, right? Not necessarily expert trained machine learning engineers, not computer scientists, you need really smart problem solvers, right? Who can use these tools that are generally consumer available, you crunch the data, you can get all these insights. And typically the cost of these actually are not very expensive, right? You need, you need a database, you need some tools, you need some smart people, and for most businesses, that's how they've traditionally over the last 15 to 20 years have been driving kind of a data-driven culture. You get into expert systems, um, which, are, which are more interesting. This is, this is really the, 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 the gift that the, the dark ages gave us in many ways. And these are um, systems like RPA, um, you know, RDF, if you guys have heard of that, relational data formats. Um, a lot of chatbots out there today, let's forget about the generative AI ones, are essentially expert systems. And, and what do expert systems mean? It means that somebody has essentially created a system based on knowledge that they have that they've encoded into a system. A great example of an expert system is something like uh, uh, the, the WebMD symptom checker. How many of you have used that at some point, right? Um, you know, essentially you go in, there's a whole decision tree, there's a set of doctors and nurses and medical practitioners who went in there and coded a decision tree that said, okay, do you have a fever? Yes, no. Is your nose running? Yes, no. Is it green? Yes, no. Right? And essentially you get to a, a set of symptoms at the, at the bottom of that tree. Here you also have lots of structured data. Um, you have um, tailored systems. You know, you need more data than you do kind of in Excel because you have to actually have to, to build out the domain space. Um, and the talent you need now are not generalists. You actually, you need to have people who understand the domain. You know, in the, in, the, in the symptom structure, you have to have people who are trained in medicine who actually are building out these models. Um, and then in terms of cost, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and these expert systems are great in a variety of situations. You, you typically use them for quality control, medical diagnostics, uh, user-based activity automation, use it for things that need to be auditable, right? And that'll be something that I'll talk about in just in a few minutes. Um, and then finally, you have machine learning. And this has been something that's taken off, let's say, over the last decade or so. Machine learning in general is not new technology. It's been used for quite a while. Um, here, the technology you're thinking about are GPUs, CPUs. Um, you're thinking about TensorFlow, PyTorch, SageMaker. You know, these are all the tools out there. Um, and what happened here is that you ended up going from needing lots of structured data and lots of experts to where you actually get, just take large quantities of data and throw it at these algorithms. Typically time, they're structured or labeled data. So if you're building an algorithm that's trying to detect the sentiment of language, you would have a set of training data that you would, you would tag, you would feed into these systems. Um, and oftentimes you would need um, talent that was a lot different in your organization. So here, it's not the smart business analyst, right, or the smart consultant. You actually need somebody who understands how to tune, train, evaluate these types of algorithms, right? So your cost curve starts getting higher and higher, not to mention the compute required, right? So now you actually are either standing up infrastructure in your data center or you're going to one of the hyperscalers and you're using their technology to train, store, curate these models. This is where you get machine learning ops. So essentially, the more power you have in these algorithms because they can do more, they're more accurate, they're more scalable, it costs more, okay? So Gen AI kind of shows up. So previous, you know, you have these kind of rough three classes. You know, once again, they're not completely kind of independent, but um, they are, you know, something that um, helps solve most of problem, solves many, many problems. So Gen AI comes, around, comes along, you know, a year and a half ago, um, and there's this huge hype cycle, right? So you have the New York Times, this is the end of everything, you know, everything's gonna get automated. I'm sure all of you had your executives asking you, hey, what's your Gen AI, Gen AI strategy? What are you doing with this? Um, you know, and I would say that um, it is really exciting technology. Just, you know, kind of understanding the state of the art and how sophisticated it's gone. There are so many use cases, so much potential. It is still early days in terms of how this is gonna play out and when um, the adoption curve is essentially gonna re reach its peak, right? And if you kind of read out there, you know, some of the hype has maybe died down. You look at traffic to, 
uh, ChatGPT peaked in June and starting to go down. That doesn't mean that this technology is not going to be a paradigm shift. It's absolutely going to be a paradigm shift. But the concrete is still wet in terms of exactly how and when you can utilize this to drive real business outcomes in businesses that we're running day to day and helping to support. So you take generative AI and you kind of add it to the spectrum and you have something that's kind of off to the right, but it actually has its own spectrum. It's not just a linear kind of progression where generative AI is more expensive than machine learning. It actually has its own spectrum in there and it depends on how you actually utilize it. What is true is that uh, generative AI systems, these deep learning models are really, really good at dealing with unstructured data. So you just take gobs and gobs and gobs of data. Some of the biggest models out there that are being built by Meta or Baidu uh, operate on trillions of tokens. And what that essentially means is trillions of words. Like, a trillion is a lot, right? And you're essentially packing all this data, you're training these large, sophisticated models. It doesn't have to be labeled, it doesn't have to be structured, you just throw everything at it. Um, and these systems make sense out of it. In terms of the inputs, this is where it gets really interesting, right? The models that most of us play around with, whether you go to ChatGPT or BARD, those are public models, right? They know a lot about kind of general stuff but they don't know a lot about your business or your domain. Um, in terms of the talent needed, depending on how you deploy it, if all you're gonna do is give your company coworkers access to ChatGPT, you don't need a lot of talent. I mean, it's essentially punching some holes in a firewall, maybe writing, writing a doc, having some sort of facilitation. But if you were in the business of actually building your own large language model, this is where you need the teams of scientists, right? PhDs, you need tons of infrastructure. Uh, building a large language model like a BARD um, we'll emit the carbon of a small country, right? And will cost tens of millions of dollars to train. And then finally, the cost, depending on what you do with it, you know, whether you start with kind of a general kind of infrastructure or something that's hyper-tailored, it could be relatively inexpensive or free all the way to tens of millions of dollars to actually implement and deploy. So to unpack this just a little bit more, when we think about the, the, the kind of applicability and the value of these large language models, um, I think about them in these kind of four different use cases. So number one is the generic model. This is essentially what you would see if you just opened up your browser today and went to ChatGPT, BARD, or any of those other providers. Um, you have probably the best trivia partner you could ever ask for, right? It's been trained on the internet, it knows Wikipedia, it can give you all sorts of information, it might hallucinate every so often, um, but ultimately um, it's got really great public knowledge. It can summarize documents for you, it can help you brainstorm. Um, you gotta be careful, right, in terms of what it produces, because it's not completely reliable. The next step is something that understands your domain, right, and, and if you've played with like Hugging Face, if you guys have heard that, it's a, it's a crazy name for a company, but essentially it's a place where they store all these models that companies have built. You see a combination of these general models that are produced by the big tech companies that are essentially your trivia partner, but then you're also seeing these models that are created for specific domains. So for example, um, uh, the legal industry, Right? So instead of training these models on everything, they train it on a narrow set of data that are legal documents, legal cases, contracts. So now you have these systems that are large language models that maybe can't tell you, you know, who was the president of the United States you know, in 1853, but could tell you um, essentially how to construct a legal document and you know, what are the types of clauses you need to worry about in certain states. So it actually understands your domain. The next level of sophistication, and, and here value is always increasing to the right as you get more kind of specific, you get these large language models that understand your enterprise, right? So this is, not only do I understand how to understand natural language, I understand how to understand a contract, and by the way, I know all the contracts you've ever created within your company, I understand your industry, I understand your domain, so I can actually be very, very intelligent in helping you on a variety of tasks. A lot of the innovation we're seeing within the industry today are essentially trying to move the ball up this value curve here, right? And as you move up that value curve, expense increases, the amount of data you need and governance and control, and then the privacy implications become pretty important, right? But ultimately value goes to the right, right? I mean, having just a system out there that can summarize an email is cool. It'll save some time and effort. You know, it'll just kind of remove a little bit of friction from the system. But ultimately, you want to get to that enterprise view, right? So something that understands your industry, understands your business, has access to proprietary data that's sitting within your firewalls, understands your sales data, understands your product information, understands your customer information, and can essentially help you reason and assist you in things that you're doing every day. What I'm super excited for, and, and we're not there yet, um, a lot of companies will claim that they're there, but they're not. 
um, which is this idea of um, getting to a personal large language model, right? So now imagine this, this is like sci-fi. It's been a kind of a promise for many years, but essentially you have a system that understands you intimately, right? So it's read all your emails, it has your whole history, right? And understands your calendar, who you interact with, and essentially can act on your behalf, right? So if somebody's talking to that bot, it's hard to distinguish them. Is it the real Sanjay or is it kind of the avatar Sanjay writing an email or responding to an email or writing a white paper or writing a blog or making a decision? This is really kind of the golden use case and it will happen eventually. We're not there yet. So let's say two, three, four years to get there. But ultimately, you know, as I mentioned, as you go up kind of this value curve, the implications of this, of this technology becomes just that much more significant. You know, imagine giving a, a large language model or a, a co-pilot, personal co-pilot access to all your information, everything that's ever been digitized for you, right? You'd wanna make sure that that's protected, you know, it's secure, that you understand what it is, you can give it rights in certain contexts and, and, and others. So we've been um, at CDW really, you know, thinking hard about how to deploy this technology. Um, you know, and, and for any kind of CIO, CTO, you know, you feel like you're not moving fast enough, but you know, I think we're also taking a very, what I would say, um, optimistically cautious approach to driving to the right use cases and making sure um, that we're acting, you know, in the best interest of, of our organization and making sure that we try the technology, test and iterate. So the first thing that we, we, we cared about, and this is something that was just part of our digital transformation was our data and infrastructure. Before generative AI, you know, became the, the rage of the town, we were in the middle of our own digital transformation. So we had invested in, in our infrastructure, we had invested in data governance, data architecture, simple things like have a master for all your customer data, have a master for all your product data, right? Have it behind APIs, have it cloud-based, right? Have some capability of measuring the quality of your data. So it's not like we're, we're perfect in our data, but we, we made those investments in making sure that the data was accessible, we understood it, and we could pipe it to other systems, right? So that's essentially base camp number one. Within a couple of weeks of ChatGPT going live last year, um, we were proactively commuting, communicating to the organization, right? There was a lot of kind of excitement. There was some fear out there, right, based on how it was hyped in the media. So I wrote a note to the entire organization and said, hey, look, we understand this technology is out here. We're gonna take a methodolo 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 methodological approach uh, to addressing this. And we, we provided a framework, a communication framework for the organization to think about it. And the communication framework really was three pieces. One is we're gonna develop new policies for fair use of this technology, right? So how do you use it every day? Just like you have policies around using search engine, social media, create a policy for how you use generative AI, right? Because I think there are rules in terms of what these systems can do and what they can't do. Good example is don't provide company confidential information to a public chat GPT interface. It's just common sense, but you actually should communicate that to your organization to make sure they understand it. Um, we also stood up an internal forum where um, we provided uh, a, an area within our intranet for coworkers to come and just share stories about how they're using it, where we would inject kind of expert opinions, uh, articles coming from outside, but also just create a place where people can talk about the recipes and how they're using it, where it works, where it didn't work, because we thought a learning culture around this would be really, really important. So that's essentially what we did within the first couple of weeks of having this um, technology cover all the newspapers. Since then, over the last year, we've done quite a bit in terms of, of laying the groundwork for us to be able to accelerate and drive innovation within the organization. The first thing that we did um, was talk to uh, several of our partners um, and we picked one partner to essentially stand up a private instance of a large language model within our cloud estate, all right? And what does that mean? It means that we created a safe space where we could actually experiment without having to worry about our company confidential information being exposed or sending it to a different cloud that was not within our estate, right? So relatively quickly, um, we worked with, um, with Microsoft and within the Azure environment, we stood up our own copy of their large language model with our own APIs, with our own interface on it. And at that point, that gave us like, this ability to drive innovation, right? So now you have a place where you could like experiment like you could actually give a company confidential information and see what it could do with it, right? Without having to worry about that being let out into the wild. Um, and doing that, we essentially started um, unlocking a little bit of innovation within the organization. So just a few months ago, we had a company-wide hackathon 
which it was not only people from IT, technology, my department, but we had people from marketing, we had people from our integrated sales teams, um, all participating in creating essentially prototypes on top of this infrastructure that we stood up. So we allowed the organization an opportunity, time, infrastructure, and the tools to experiment based on where they were in the organization. If they saw a problem in their day-to-day -day life, hey, look, we could use generative AI to augment product data. All right, spend a couple days and put something together um, and see what you can do with it. Um, we also experimented with a type, type of technology and a type of approach called RAG, which is Retrieval Augmented Generation. This is like a, a very um, cost-effective way of getting your algorithm to understand your enterprise, your large language models. So it uses something called a vector database, um, and you can actually throw it internal documents, and now your large language model can actually answer questions about your enterprise. And so we stood up this infrastructure, we started training it on internal documents just to see what it could do, right? And we were surprised that about 80% of the time it worked really well, 20% of the times it didn't, right? So it gave us a good idea of what are the use cases that work and what are the, the, the use cases that, that couldn't work. The other thing that we did is we actually talked to a lot of our partners, specifically our SaaS software providers that we run internally within our organization. So, you know, we have Salesforce, we have ServiceNow, we have Azure, um, you know, we have some AWS. We talked to all those providers to understand what's coming in their platforms, right? And one of the calculuses that we made several years ago about investing in these SaaS platforms was just for this type of moment, right? Where some new disruptive technology would show up and instead of us, CDW, having to reinvent the wheel and build it from scratch, we could actually leverage our partners to understand what was coming on their roadmaps and then figure out where to invest and what to roll out. And then ultimately, this really came back to thinking about our AI capabilities as a portfolio. And what does that mean? It means that historically, we've invested in AI use cases. Not all the AI use cases need to move to the right, right? So if I think about just that portfolio, there's three decisions to make. What are the AI capabilities that we currently have today that are either algorithms, expert systems, machine learning, and um, which one should remain kind of in those buckets? Because not everything should be a generative AI use case. Some of them you can solve with the traditional machine learning model. Some of them are an expert system. Makes a ton of sense, just leave it there. There are a set of capabilities that we had that we said, oh my gosh, we want to upgrade this using generative AI, right? So if you have a chat bot kind of floating around, there's a case to say, this use case is super valuable. Let's figure out how to potentially augment it with generative AI capabilities so it can do more. So which ones do you want to shift to the right? And then probably most importantly, what are those new use cases out there that our teams are dreaming up, either through hackathon, either through tops down uh, planning, bottoms up planning, that are innovative? How do we tie it to business value? And then how do we just break it down into small pieces and experiment really, really fast? Right, so it's all about that experimentation culture. It's about setting up the right infrastructure. It's about understanding your data. And it's really about unleashing the capability within the organization, but also doing it from a lens where not everything is a generative AI use case, right? AI is broad, there's lots of technologies. It will change the world, but it's gonna be that balanced portfolio that really is gonna be the thing that, that, that means success for us. Um, so that's where we are. Um, as you can see, like, we're, we're not even halfway up the mountain, right? I actually don't even know where the peak of that mountain is, right? And, and you know, as I mentioned, the, the concrete is still wet in terms of the advancements that are made, being made, you know, either the core large language models and what can they do and what can't they do, um, as well as all the technology partners out there today in the ecosystem who are driving this into their products, right? So it's unclear exactly where that, where that, where that uh, peak is, um, but we're slowly trudging our way up to base camp two, to base camp three, four, all the way up to, to eventually what will be an AI-enabled future where this is gonna be really completely transformational. But I'm, I'm super excited. You know, I hope that many of you are kind of in the same boat of experimentation and kind of understanding those use cases, standing up that infrastructure, building that community, um, and really unleashing that talent within your organization.